Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the day and tentatively the last session of the week, or officially the last session of the second week. We have a very exciting presentation for you today. It's about geomechanics, which is something that I love because I'm a geomechanics engineer. So today we have a top-notch speaker for you. He is SPE, Distinguished Lecturer, and if you don't know what that means, my friend, you've been living under a rock. Okay, so let me introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Hamid Sarouch. Dr. Hamid Sarouch is, is an internationally recognized geomechanics expert with more than 25 years of experience in geomechanics applications. He has conducted or managed more than 250 consulting and research projects worldwide. Dr. Hamid is currently the CEO of PetroLearn LLC, with the objective to apply learning from oil and gas to accelerate movement towards clean energy. Dr. Hamid holds a bachelor's degree in mining engineering, master's in rock mechanics, and a PhD in petroleum engineering from Curtin University in Australia. Um, he has been selected as the SB Distinguished Lecturer in 2012, 2017, and 2020. Dr. Hamid, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Nihal, for the uh, introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a big pleasure to be part of this program and uh, present to students. They're always dear to us and uh, uh, it's, it's quite exciting actually to present to 500 people. I've done a lot of courses around the world and presentation. I don't think if I've ever presented to this many people. So uh, uh, let's see how it goes. I hope that uh, students uh, like it and, and uh, take advantage of, uh, I mean, take some, some knowledge with them uh, after the, the presentation. So uh, what I did actually, uh, I tried to, to eliminate all the theoretical background and, uh, you know, math and physics out of the presentation uh, and make it more practical is important for a student to me because uh, you know they learn a lot of uh, uh, theories uh, without knowing the, the actual you know applications in the industry so what i'm going to do i will uh, walk you actually what i give a little bit of background about geomechanics but mainly i, I walk you through uh, the important applications that geomechanics have in the oil and gas industry is not, uh, I mean, exclusively for oil and gas because we are applying the same concept, the same application to uh, to any subsurface engineering, basically, uh, application like, you know, uh, geothermal energy, like carbon sequestration. Uh, and it's good uh, for students to know that uh, outside the oil and gas industry, there are, there are also application for for what they learn in, in, at the school and uh, they can maybe apply it in somewhere else. Specifically in this current environment with, with oil and gas, I see a lot of students are thinking, are, are getting worried about their future, but don't worry about it. There are, there are many other good applications that you can apply your knowledge and learnings from the school. So uh, just uh, going to the, I mean, over the agenda, uh, I, I will do a, a quick introduction on geomechanics, the importance of it. And then I divided the applications to drilling applications and production applications. Under drilling applications, uh, we talk about wellbore stability and well design, which is one of the most important uh, application of geomechanics and maybe one of the oldest one. Uh, and also talk about underbalanced drilling and how geomechanics can, can basically uh, add value to that. Uh, then under production, we talk about uh, production from natural fractures, which is uh, very important, uh, specifically if, uh, when we talk about the uh, tight formations like shale gas, uh, like tight sand. And especially when I see uh, there are a lot of uh, students involved from, from uh, Middle East, and we know that most of the reservoirs in Middle East are, are natural carbon, I mean, naturally fractured carbonates. So uh, it's quite important to, to understand it. Uh, we talk about hydraulic fracturing, of course, is one of the most well-known application of geomechanics. And a little bit about reservoir compaction and reservoir, uh, basically, uh, performance during the, the whole life of a reservoir. Uh, and uh, I don't know why I have sand production here, but I didn't actually include that 
but it's, it's, it's an application under production. So we don't really get time to talk about sand production prediction here. And then I'm available to answer as many as questions as uh, we can. So what is the definition of uh, rock mechanics? I, I always start with rock mechanics because uh, geomechanics basically goes back to rock mechanics. Uh, rock mechanics is the, the theory and, and applied science uh, which try to, to predict the behavior of the rocks when we put them on the, under uh, forces, pressures, stresses. So basically we have an environment of a stress, pressure, forces, and, and a rock. And rock mechanics try to, to model. I mean, if we change this, this uh, force field, how the rock will react, how it deform. Does it fail? Does it you know, just deform or, or it doesn't really do anything, right? So uh, the term geomechanics is basically a broader term which covers any type of geomaterials, whatever you have below the surface, either is it, is it soil or rock, or I don't know what, what other materials might exist below the surface, but geomechanics cover any geomaterial, right? Uh, so I see people interchangeably, uh, I mean, use this, these terms, but uh, uh, when, when we are in oil and gas industry, when we use term geomechanics, basically we are referring to rock mechanics because we are not dealing with soil, right? We are, we are mainly dealing with, with rocks. And uh, just, just, I mean, uh, for you guys to, uh, to, to understand these two terms, it's really important actually, because some people get confused. Some people think that you know rock mechanics is anything in the lab scale. When we go to the field, it, it's geomechanics. No, it's, it's not the case. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, like companies like Chevron, they, they consistently use rock mechanics for, for instead of geomechanics. Uh, if you go to mining industry, they use rock mechanics. Probably they, if you use geomechanics, there are less people actually uh, getting connection with that. But in oil and gas industry, we are using geomechanics more uh, commonly than, than rock mechanics. But honestly, they're the same, the same uh, thing. Uh, so, and you have heard of petroleum geomechanics, and of course it is the application of geomechanics when we talk about petroleum, oil and gas, right? So if you want to make a definition uh, for Petroleum geomechanics is a discipline that uh, integrates uh, geophysics, petrophysics, ge geological data, and combine them with rock mechanics science to, to quantify the response of the earth or subsurface formations to stresses, to any change in stresses or reservoir pressure or formation temperature, right? So in petroleum geomechanics, we are dealing with higher temperatures, higher pressures, stresses, uh, and uh, it makes us actually, it makes it more difficult if you want to say, I mean, uh, if it is geomechanics of mining engineering is, is, is easier or the, the oil and gas industry, I would say the first challenge in petroleum industry is that we don't have access, direct access to the rocks, right? If, if, you, if you are in the mining or tunneling industry, you can go and you know, sample the rock, you can touch the rock, you can look at it, you can look at the fractures in the rock and, and characterize it. But in oil and gas industry, if we are very lucky, all we get is a, is a core, uh, like a small core, usually four inch maximum uh, out of the, the well. And honestly, in 50% in, in of the cases, we don't even have that. You know, we get some logs uh, which are coming out of the, the downhole or sometimes uh, images of the well bore wall, which we, we need to analyze and do our, our interpretation based on, based on those data. So it's, data is an issue. And as I said, uh, stress, higher stress and higher temperature are another, uh, other challenges of us in compared with, with shallow projects. So the role of geomechanics in oil and gas industry, to me, uh, regardless of, I mean, what, uh, what are our profession, uh, professions or, or background or what industry we're working on, uh, we have three important objectives. To reduce non-productive time, what we typically call it NPT. So the time that we spend without doing anything useful, like. It might be due to solving a problem, you know, fixing a, a mechanical 
uh, problem or waiting on weather uh, because the weather is so bad that we cannot uh, continue the operation. So we want to reduce that because it, 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 it basically delays the project and add cost to it. And the second objective is, is re to reduce the cost. We don't want to spend uh, the money that are not really required to, to spend. So we want to minimize our cost. This minimizing the cost should not uh, cut the uh, should not basically uh, cut the cost of safety because that's really important, right? But the cost of operations with smarter technologies, with smarter decisions, right? And the third one is minimizing risk. And honestly, geomechanics help us with all of these three objectives. And, and I, I will, I will sh show you how geomechanics can basically help us with this. And uh, uh, if we don't do that, you know, uh, this is the result. This is the Macondo case in, in uh, you know, Gulf of Mexico 10 years ago. And I think, uh, I don't know if probably you, you guys remember that if, if you were following oil and gas industry 10 years ago, <laughs> probably not. Uh, but it was, it was a really uh, uh, big disaster and the environmental impact of it are still exist. And, uh, the operators are still paying for that. So we want to avoid that. So how much geomechanics can contribute to, to oil and gas operations? Uh, there are actually several uh, statistics out there uh, showing that you know, each company, each operator, how much they are losing because of the problems which are related to geomechanics, right? But the best uh, or the most organized, uh, basically, reference is a paper by Dodson and Dodson back in 2004, which uh, they actually went through all the publicly available data in the Gulf of Mexico. They looked at all the wells uh, and they extracted all the you know, non-productive time during the drilling, and they tried to find the, the problems behind them. What, what was the reason for that? And then they classify those uh, problems with, basically uh, classify them to the, to the list of the, the problems. What I uh, uh, extracted from those data, I, I basically separated the geomechanical related problems versus the, I don't know, operational problems, weather problems, or any other problems that might actually uh, create you know, non-productive time, okay? So according to this analysis, 41% of the non-productive time during drilling is because of the wellbore, wellbore stability problems, right? Which are related to geomechanics, to stresses, to rock properties, or uh, you know, uh, wrong design for, for casings, for, for the well geometry, and this type of things, right? That we can solve with geomechanics. <clears throat> so the cost of this problems, only geomechanical related problems for the operators in the, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico only, is about 8 billion you know, American dollars per year. And it's a huge money, right? So I don't know how much uh, uh, you guys earn or you, your sellers are, but uh, for, for me, this is a big money. And if you wanted to make, make it sensible, just try to calculate, I don't know how many Shisha, you can, you can smoke in, in Middle East with this money or how many beer you can drink. So then, then you, you feel how big is this, this number, right? So the objective of geomechanics is, is to save this money for, for operators. It's one of the objectives, right? While, while we, we keep an eye on safety and time. So what are the applications of geomechanics. So this slide actually showed the overall uh, applications starting from pore pressure prediction uh, that we need to do before we drill a well or we touch a, you know, a, a field. We need to know how the pressures are down there. So when we drill a well, we don't get surprised by getting kicks or blowouts or uh, hazards uh, like what I should just showed you, uh, like at Makenda, right? So Next application is wellbore stability. So we, we want to avoid uh, problems that stop us from drilling or losing the well. Lost circulation is another application. We, we want to be able to avoid uh, losing the, the mud, which is basically uh, used for drilling 
into the formation because this is a costly problem actually to to lose the the model so going to the reservoir uh, we want to do fracking we we want to monitor the reservoir to to see if it's, it gets compacted how compaction of the reservoir affect the porosity permeability of the reservoir does it uh, basically stop us from producing more uh, how we can manage the reservoir to to basically have maximum uh, you know uh, ultimate recovery from the reservoir and and leave less oil and gas in the reservoir right so uh, do we get uh, sand production from the sand stone reservoir or not uh, basically geomechanics can can help us to predict that and can help us to 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 minimize it or avoid it or mitigate it right or if we are dealing with fractured reservoir basically how how we should uh, deal with those those natural reservoirs and uh, natural fractures and uh, maximize our production from that okay so we, we, we will cover uh, most of this application actually in this presentation so as you see the application of geomechanics is from well scale like well bore stability all the way to the reservoir scale or field scale which we talk about the reservoir geomechanics and it starts before we developing a field or drilling into a field all the way through you know production and even after that when we abandon the well we still need, need to take care of the subsidence at the surface we don't want to see these features actually especially, especially if you're close to you know residential areas or uh, I mean, we, we, we want to avoid any, any hazard basically coming out of the, the surface uh, deformation, right? So we continue doing geomechanics even after abandoning a, uh, a field, okay? So to do all these uh, applications and save all those money and time and, and increase the safety, all we need as a base is, a, is what we call a geomechanical model or geomechanical earth model or mechanical earth model, right? So different companies use different basically terminology. Uh, my favorite one is geomechanical earth model because uh, the abbreviation is GEM and geomechanical model, geomechanics model is, is really a GEM because you know, something that can, can save us, you know, $8 billion is, is more than a GEM, right? So, uh, Geomechanical model uh, comprises six main components, right? Those are three stresses, right? Which are, uh, one of them is, is vertical and the, the other two are horizontal. One is larger than the other one. So we call them maximum horizontal stress and minimum horizontal stress. So these stresses can be principal stresses or not, uh, but uh, usually we could be basically, uh, the output of geomechanics uh, model is, is, is in terms of you know vertical and horizontal stresses. So these stresses have an orientation. We call it uh, usually we use SHMAC azimuth to to show the stress orientation. And then within uh, I mean these stresses are applied to a formation or rock or rock layers, which have some properties. They have a strength. They have elastic properties. They have creep. You know. All these rock properties go to one component, which is called rock properties. And then within these uh, rocks, there are porous spaces which are filled by either water or oil or gas or combination. So they have, they're under pressure. So we call it pore pressure, right? So if we have these six parameters, we can actually have a geomechanical model and adding to that or faults and fractures, geological features, you know, uh, formation tops, uh, uh, geometry of the formations and rocks. And these are input to the data, uh, to, to a geomechanical model. They are not basically major component of, of the model, but the input. Okay, so if we have these six uh, parameters, we can have uh, a model, a cube of rock with all these properties that we can drill into it to see what happens to our well. We can do hydraulic fracturing in it and see the reaction of the rock, geometry of the hydraulic fractures. We can produce from it and see how the, 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 res the formation gets compacted and react to the production. We can inject into it and see the effect of injection on stresses, on you know, rock properties. We can inject CO2 into it, right? We can extract geothermal energy from it if there are hot rocks. And the model gives us the reaction of the rock, right? It's rock mechanics. It's, 
it, it models the rock behavior actually under changes in the environment. So in a 1D uh, basically setup, if you are, when I say 1D is, is along a wellbore, right? With really well, it is either vertical or deviated or horizontal. So, and we measure the six um, main components. We create what we call it a 1D geomechanical model. And as you see on paper, it looks like this. So we have the pore pressure, we have three principal, three stresses, vertical and two horizontal. And uh, we have rock property, which is actually in this red uh, curve here later on. Uh, this basically uh, rock property are consolidated in the parameters that we call it collapse gradient, right? And it shows that how much mud weight we need to actually support the rock, doesn't let it to fail or collapse in, into the well, right? So from those six components, we have uh, five of them here was the last one is the orientation of stress that we actually show it like this. So it shows that the maximum horizontal stress is oriented toward, uh, toward uh, 135 degree, right? So it's kind of the south uh, east. So this is a typical 1D geomechanical model. If you want to create a 3D geomechanical model for the whole field or the whole, whole reservoir, what we need to have is first of all, a structural geology model. So we need a model which consists of all the faults, fractures, formation tops, and any features that might be important for geomechanical modeling, right? This usually comes out of the geo, geo modeling. Uh, there are different softwares in the market that you can use to generate this, but it's not what geomechanics people do. This input to our models. The geomechanics part goes to uh, a numerical model. So basically, is a model consists of grids. These grids are mathematically and mechanically connected. So whenever you ch you create a change in a node or a part of the, the numerical model, you will see the effect will be propagated in all over the model. So you, you will see the effect everywhere else, right? So we have all the rock properties in this model. We have stresses, stress orientation, and pore pressure all consolidated in this model, okay? And now the last part of a 3D geomechanical model is the reservoir model. So this comes from reservoir engineering. So and in this type of, in this part of the model is, is, is the reservoir pressure and changes in the reservoir with the, with, the pro, with the production, the porosity and permeability. And then if we manage to couple these two models, then we can see the changes in the stresses due to production or injection, or we can see the effect of uh, basically rock property ch changes on the reservoir properties. We will see during production as the stresses change, how the porosity and permeability of the reservoir change and of course, how the production will decline, right? So geomechanics give us a very good insight into a long-term management of the reservoir. Is it better to, to, to produce in a high rate and, and produce as soon as possible, or should we actually produce in a, in, in a long-term, right? And uh, uh, basically uh, doesn't let the, the reservoir to get compacted uh, sooner, right? So uh, it's very, very important application that uh, usually, I mean, typically uh, in the, I would say until 10 years ago, uh, there were a few companies actually considering that, but now, now that you see more and more companies actually include geomechanics to their uh, reservoir modeling uh, activities. So if we have these uh, three models combined and, and linked to, to each other, so we call it coupled or you know, reservoir uh, geomechanics model. Then we can, we can see the, the changes in, in the stress orientation during the whole life of the reservoir in different years. We can see how the fractures fault in the reservoir get activated, reactivated during production time. So they might create risk to the project if, if they get activated and sometimes they actually help improve production but geomechanics can predict, predict all these cases, right? So if we don't do geomechanical modeling, uh, we basically are producing from a reservoir blindly. We, we don't really know what, what happens in, in one year from now, 10 years from now, or even one, one week from now. And we can extract one D geomechanical model from a 3D geomechanical modeling, but in compare with one D model, usually the resolution of the model is, is very low. 
uh, you know, when uh, in, in 1D modeling, we are talking about, I don't know, having data points every half a, in, uh, I mean, half a foot or even less. In 3D setups, usually if we don't want to make our computation uh, very heavy, uh, we go for grids of 50 by 50 meters. I keep, I, I use, uh, basically, I, I prefer to use uh, meters uh, since you, are, you guys are international. I don't know how many of you are in the US, but uh, yeah, 50 by 50 is a typical uh, grid size for, for 3D geomechanical modeling. Uh, when we get closer to the problem, usually we increase it to maybe 20 by 20 or 10 by 10 meters, but it's still, I mean, much, much, uh, coarser than you know uh, five centimeter ten centimeter of data which is not really perfect for uh, wellbore stability okay so uh, definition of stress regime I don't know how uh, how much you are familiar with stress regimes in the area that you you, you do your operations but uh, the relative magnitude of the three stresses, vertical and two horizontals, tell you which stress regime you are. If the vertical stress is the largest stress and horizontal stresses are smaller than that, we are in normal stress regime, right? One of the indications of this basically stress regime are the faults in the, in the region, right? If most of your active faults are normal faults, it means basically the movement of the of the two side of the basically uh, uh, the the shear surface, which is the fault, is is downward, right? So we are we are in a normal stress regime. Again, I emphasize that if the active faults are normal, because we might have, you know, uh, very old faults that have been created on a previous stress regime. Uh, but they are not active uh, uh, under current or present day stress uh, condition. They are, they are not actually good indication of the current stress regime, right? They show the old time stress orientation or stress condition. So if you want to use the faults to get the stress uh, regime, we need to make sure that they are active under present day. Okay. So if min maximum horizontal stress is larger than then the vertical stress, right? So we are in a strike slip stress regime. So majority of the, 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 the faults under this stress regime are strike slip. So the, the movement is basically uh, uh, parallel to the, uh, to basically perpendicular to the surface, right? And a good example of uh, these faults is the San Andreas fault in California. You see the trace of the fault on the surface and you see how actually uh, the fault is, is moving the, the features on the surface because the movement is, you know, uh, is like what you see here. So there's no vertical movement, it's more horizontal. And the last stress regime is when the both horizontal stresses are larger than the vertical stress. And that's called reverse stress regime or thrust stress regime. So depends on which stress regime you operate, your, the reaction of the formations of rocks to your operations is completely different. If you drill a horizontal well in a normal stress regime, right, you will get a different re reaction from the formations than drilling the same exact geometry of the well in a strike slip or reverse stress regime. If you do hydraulic fracturing in a normal stress regime, you will get a totally different geometry of fracture than reverse or strike slip, right? So it's very important to know where in which stress regime we are going to, to do our operations. Either it is drilling or hydraulic fracturing or production uh, or, or whatever, right? So let's uh, move to the drilling applications. Uh, what is wellbore stability? So when we drill a well into, form into some basically uh, formations with different properties and of course different lithology or ge geological uh, uh, types, so those reacts to drilling to making a hole inside them quite differently, right? Some, some, uh, some, some formations are, are naturally fractures, uh, they react in a different way than, than the, the formations which are not fractures but they are weak or, or 
they are brittle, right? Or they are they are swelling shale. You now some shales are brittle, some some shales are, uh, are are more ductile, so they swell. They react totally different. Rather than you know getting broken or collapsed, they they basically converge in, into the well. Or if you are familiar with, with saturated salt formations, they, they, are, they are very plastic material. They're like dough that you make bread with it, right? So if you make a hole in them, in a, in a second, actually, they get closed. So we have to think about uh, you know, a, a solution for that. When we drill into them, how, how should we actually do drilling, do our operations to, to stop that? Uh, some, some formation collapse into the rock, some formation basically, so when they collapse, you see the, the wellbore gets enlarged, Right, so the this final size of the wellbore is not the bit size anymore, and it creates some problems. Some other formations basically uh, swell into the to the well and try to close it. So we have to know these things or predict these things in advance. And how we get this property of the rock, we basically look at the the wireline the wireline logs, uh, which give us uh, information about the you know velocity of the of uh, uh, sonic uh, waves right this is one of the important uh, information we get out of logging we get the density of the formations from logging we get the gamma ray how much clay content exists in the rock uh, and several other like porosity right Th these are the typical information that we get with the uh, I mean, basic logging uh, operations and we we gather all this information and we run through uh, some analysis and we get uh, rock properties out of that and then we can predict how this formation will react to our drilling right so one side of the well bore stability problem is when the the pressure inside the well because you know that when we drill we, we have fluid we have drilling fluid there with the high pressure to keep basically to keep the pore pressure back and also keep these formations stable if that pressure is not enough then the formation start deforming and uh, creating problem Right, so this is one side of the the wellbore stability. The other side of it is that when the the uh, fluid pressure is too high, so we basically create fractures inside the rock. They can be, you know, induced fractures. We artificially create them because of the high pressure is exactly like hydraulic fracturing, or we might reopen an existing fracture, and then through this fracture we will lose the the mud, the the, the fluid drilling fluid, right, which is as I said, it's a costly problem. So we have to avoid both problems while at the same time, we should keep the, the pore pressure back. We should not let the pore pressure to flow into the well and create problems like blowouts and you know, uh, those uh, uh, basically uh, disasters that sometimes happen on, on, the, on the rig or on the platform, right? Okay, so overall, these are different type of the, the, the wellbore stability that we see. Uh, now let's see what we do in the industry. Usually before we start drilling, we, have, we create something called mud weight window. It is a window that if you keep your mud weight in between the window, it means that you are safe, right? And what I'm showing you right now is the classical definition of the the mud weight window, safe operating mud weight window. Uh, and this type of mud weight window has been developed since 100 years ago, maybe, where geomechanics didn't even exist, but they're still widely used in the industry, unfortunately. And the concept behind this mud weight window is that, okay, one side of the window is pore pressure. It means our mud weight should be always above pore pressure, so we don't get major kicks or blowout. These are the most you know, uh, dangerous problems that you might get on, on the you know, drilling side. The other side is fracture gradient or fracture pressure. It means if your mud weight increases this fracture, you will create induced fractures and you will have your uh, mud lost, right? So to avoid these two problems, we have to keep the mud weight always in between these two lines. But is this the whole story? The answer is no. There is another important line here, which typically, classically, we have been missing it. And that's called collapse gradient. What is collapse gradient? It's the minimum mud weight that we need to keep the formations stable, 
we, we stop any, any collapsing or any shear failure or convergence of the formation into the well bore. So this is how we can continue the drilling operations. Otherwise, if the, the well bore is full of you know, uh, uh, rock debris or uh, the salt is closed or the shale, swelling shale is closing the well bore, basically we, we lose all the uh, you know, capital that we put for the, uh, all the money we spend on, on drilling. And, and, and we lose the objective, right? So now imagine we drill with the mud weight here, right? And we don't have this line. It means drilling is gonna be safe, but we are just lucky. How if we drill with the mud weight here, right? Classically, we, are, we, we should be okay. But when we drill, we get a lot of wellbore stability problem. We get a lot of you know, extra caving, cuttings coming to the well, the, the tools get stuck in the well. <clears throat> and these problems basically create non-productive time if they don't stop us from drilling, right? So collapse gradient is one of the most important actually inputs that uh, contributions of geomechanics to, to drilling. Now, if we are dealing with now, uh, how if this, this, this line is instead of being uh, above the pore pressure is below the pore pressure, what does it mean? It means that the formation is strong, so it, it can support itself without, without needing a lot of uh, mud weight or drilling pressure fluid to, to keep them, you know, to support them. So in this case, if the collapse gradient is below pore pressure, then is the only and only case that we can drill a well with a mud weight below pore pressure. We call it underbalanced drilling. And it's quite important for uh, oil and gas in industry to drill under balance. There are several advantages actually it has. First of all, you are drilling in a very low, much lower pressure with respect to the mud. So the bit can, can drill faster. So you, you drill faster, you save some time. At the same time, because the, the mud pressure is not overbalanced, you don't push the mud into the formation, specifically in the reservoir. So you don't damage the reservoir, right? So damaging the reservoir is quite costly. So because the first operation we do after drilling a well is to clean the reservoir section and, and remove all the damage. Otherwise we cannot get production, right? So underbalanced drilling basically avoid that. Plus, if you are drilling into a tight formation like shale or tight sand, and you are in exploration phase, you want to, to get gas, you want to detect the gas and underbalance while drilling, right? Because you are doing exploration. Uh, so if, if you are overbalanced, you can easily miss a reservoir because you no know, formation doesn't have enough permeability to, to send the gas or, or oil to the, uh, to the well. So we like to do underbalance because it's the only methodology, drilling technology that you can produce as you drill. So there are advantages so, uh, to, to underbalanced drilling, but the first step to do underbalanced drilling feasibility is to draw this two line, calculate this two line and, and make sure that this red line is below the blue line, okay? Uh, yeah, now imagine we are drilling into a you know, weak or heavily fractured formation like, like the carbonates that we have in the, in the Middle East. So in these cases, First of all, the rock is weak, so it needs a lot of uh, support from the mud. So this red line collapse gradient is higher. From the other side, we have existing fractures that basically reduce the frag gradient quite a lot. So you don't need to create a fracture. You just need to reopen the fracture and for that you need a lower mud pressure. So this frag gradient goes uh, close to the collapse gradient. So this is the case that we call it very narrow mud weight window case. And it's really, really hard to keep the mud weight in between this window, these two lines. So in these cases, usually technology come to help us and we have something called managed pressure drilling. Managed pressure drilling basically help us to, to manage the, the downhole pressure uh, to basically in a very fine way, we can, we can keep the, we can increase or reduce the, uh, the mud weight or the mud pressure to keep, the, keep, keep it inside this window, right? Uh, sometimes this window is totally closed, so without technology, without managed pressure drilling or uh, casing, uh, drilling with casing, we, we won't be able to, to drill these sections. 
But the contribution of geomechanics is that it shows us which, which intervals we have this situation. So we have to think about the drilling technology. So as you see geomechanics, apart from calculating this line for us and giving us this window, it can help us to, to optimize the drilling technology that we are going to use. Okay, so what happens when we drill a well? When we drill a well, we actually uh, disturb the, the, the virgin stress condition. So imagine this is the vertical well we drill and we are looking from, from up. So the vertical stress is gone. So we, what we see is the, the minimum and maximum horizontal stresses. So we drill a rock uh, uh, deformation, we, we remove the rock from, from, from basically the supporting, uh, uh, remove the, the supporting effect of the rocks on the, on the rest of the formation, right? And then we put a mud, which kind of try to, you know, uh, compensate for that effect, right? But we know that the rock is applying to an isotropic, two different stresses to the you know, surrounding rock. When we apply mod, is is a kind of constant uh, isotropic pressure, right? So this causes distribution. I mean, redistribution of the stress around the well bore. Okay, so we cannot exactly replicate the the initial condition. So it happens somehow that the maximum hoop stress or tangential stress around the well bore goes at the orientation where the minimum horizontal stress is, and the, sorry, the maximum compression, the maximum tangential stress, the, and the minimum tangential stress goes to the orientation where the maximum horizontal stress is. And that calls basically any failure in the rock, either shear failure or compression failure will happen at this orientation, right? So these features are basically the result of shear failure of the formation because there's not enough support on it. And we call them breakouts. They usually form at uh, two opposite sides of the well bore. And if you are dealing with a vertical well, they show the orientation of ma minimum horizontal stress. Now, if uh, we are supposed to get losses because the mud weight is high, or if we are doing hydraulic fracturing, we expect to see the, the induced fracture actually develop in this orientation because is the, is the minimum tangential stress, so is the easiest location to open a new fracture. Okay, so these features are either hydraulic fractures or during drilling because of the hot, high mud weight, we might create them artificially and we call them drilling induced tensile fractures. They show the orientation of the maximum horizontal stress. These two features are quite important for us to characterize the stress field and specifically getting the orientation of the stress. It's not just in the vertical well, even in deviated well or horizontal well, we can use this, these features and back calculate the orientation of the stress, right? So the, if, you, if you take image, like picture of the wellbore wall and you unwrap it, this is how you see the breakouts. So there are two dark bands, right? Uh, which are 180 degree apart from each other. The whole unwrapped picture is 360, right? Is the, the picture of the wellbore. Uh, and image lock are quite important actually information for geomechanics. Uh, we usually don't get them. So let's go back to the uh, 1D wellbore stability model. So the, the major output of a wellbore stability study for a well is what we call it you now uh, mud weight window. And again, going back to this uh, cartoon that I showed you before, we have pore pressure here, we have collapse gradient, the red line here, we have frag gradient, and then the green area is always between either uh, with, between the frag gradient and either collapse gradient or pore pressure, whichever is larger. As you see here, collapse gradient is controlling the window, but in this section, pore pressure is controlling it, right? So we have to always stay within this green area. So now look at this uh, black line here is the actual mud weight that operators use to drill a well. And this dashed line is the ECD, is the equivalent mod weight when we cir circulate the, the mod, right? So when we cir circulate the mod, we are adding another pressure on top of the, the, the basically weight of the, the mod. So as you see, in some sections, basically the, uh, 
the mod weight is going below the, the collapse gradient, gradient. So these are the sections that we, we expect to, to see some uh, collapse in the, in, in the formation. And if you go to drilling reports and look for problems like cavings, like extra cuttings, or problems like uh, tool got stuck in the well, or we had tight holes, you, you will see actually several of them happens here. Why? Because when we, when we design our mud weight, we didn't have this red line. We just decide based on pore pressure and fracture gradient, which is a mistake, right? Now you see some sections, actually the maximum pressure in the well uh, exceed the, the frac gradient. And these are the sections that we, we expect to see, you know, mud losses, loss circulation problems. And it was the case in this, this is actually a typical well in the North Sea. Uh, and we had huge actually problem uh, with losing our mud here. Uh, and that, that was basically because the, the frac gradient estimation was not correct. It was too high. But geomechanical model showed us that, you know, this, this is the real frac gradient <clears throat> and could explain the problem. So typically these, these problems might uh, delay one day to one week uh, in the drilling uh, progress. So this is quite costly. And talking about the HPHD field like this, which is offshore, we are talking about uh, cost of $250,000 to $300,000 per day, right? So if you delay one hour, you're costing you know, more than $30,000. So another output of uh, wellbore stabilities, which is really, really helpful and interesting is, is, is this polar plots. Uh, so I don't know how much familiar you are with polar plots. Geologists use them to show the, the, the fractures and faults and the orientation. But in drilling, we use polar plots. It's basically a projection of a, you know, a, a semi-hemisphere. Uh, and if you can imagine a, a semi-hemisphere and you drill a vertical well to it, the intersection of the vertical well uh, and the projection is, is right at the center. And if you drill horizontal wells, the intersection would be actually on the edges of the circle. So with these plots, we can basically show any wellbore trajectory. For example, uh, this point here is the wellbore which has been drilled with uh, 60 degree. So it's a 30 degree, 60 degree, and uh, 90 degree. So here is 60 degree deviated well. In the north is orientation, right? So the, the exact azimuth is basically 60 degree as well, right? So we can show all the uh, trajectories uh, that are possible. What geomechanics adds to this plot are this bunch of colors. But these colors mean a lot, right? They're, I mean, they're, they can be color coded to pore pressure, to collapse gradient, or the, the fracture gradient. Like this circle on the, on the left is color coded to collapse gradient. The other one is, is frac gradient. And kind of they gave us the, the mud weight window for a certain, basically, depth or formation for all type of well trajectories, right? For example, if you want to drill a vertical well here, the minimum mud weight that we need is red, is about 14 ppg, right? And the maximum pressure that we can apply is something like 13, uh, um, uh, meaning that actually we, we don't really have window here for, for drilling a vertical well. But let's see what happens if we want to drill a horizontal well. Then our window starts from 8.7 ppg going all the way to uh, 21. So we have a very wide window for a horizontal drilling, right? So the conception that vertical drilling, vertical wells are always easier to drill uh, is not correct. It's actually the, the stress regime dictating that, right? So in some areas drilling horizontally, apart from technology limitation, is, is regarding mud weight is, is much easier to, to drill, right? And those are usually a strike slip and reverse faulting stress regime. But in normal stress regime, usually the vertical you know, drilling is, is, is much easier. So this basically help us, this plot, to, to optimize our wellbore trajectory, right? So is it the same if we drill horizontal in this direction than this direction? The model sh shows yes. I mean, drilling this direction is much, much di more difficult than this direction. So why? Because of the stress orientation. Right. So these plots basically help companies to optimize the trajectory and go to the trajectories that are required less mud weight and, uh, you know, uh, you can drill faster. But of course, if you have flexibility, if, if you have to drill vertical, then 
uh, yeah, you, you just pick up the, the mod weight that you need here. Okay, this is a very interesting example <clears throat> of an old well in, in, in Australia, North uh, uh, West Shelf of Australia. So this type of plots, we call them, uh, you know, uh, drilling progress plots. So it shows depth versus days. And uh, usually before we drill a well, we have a plan. We, 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 we plan how many meters we should drill every day to get to the target after, I don't know, this, this many days, right? And uh, the plan here was this basically black line here. Uh, and typically when we, we do the drilling because, all the, because of all the unpredicted, you know, uh, things that might happen, usually the, the actual drilling plot is different. And in this case, what this was this red, you know, curve here. You see, they face different type of problems, like they, they got too less stock in the world, they got lost circulation, they got, you know, uh, well kicks, all, all different type of uh, incidents basically delay the project to, I think up to like about 45 days uh, behind the plan. And finally they couldn't actually made it, made it to the target, right? They, they, they had to stop the well. And they had to sidetrack the well two times because the well bore collapsed, they couldn't continue the drilling, to, so they had, had to you now pull back, plug the well and, 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 and create another well actually. So this costs millions of dollars to the project, but what was the problem? So after this well was drilled, so we did a geomechanical study and we showed the, the operators what the problem was. I mean, you, you chose, um, first of all, the casing design was wrong. So we changed the case. So did, you see this uh, basically uh, like flat sections here. Th these are the times that are required for to putting the casing. So usually, there's no drilling, we're just doing casing, you know, operation. This is why they're kind of flat here. So the new casing program was different. As you see, these this flat areas are, are different in the blue curve, right? And we changed the mud weight uh, program for them. And then the next well they drilled, this black, uh, this blue curve is, is the basically progress uh, curve. And you see they actually could made it to the target five days before the plan. It's all because of you know, geomechanical information. We, we knew stresses, we knew rock properties, and we designed based on that, right? <clears throat> so the cost of 50, 45 days to a project is, is killing. You know, it's, not, it's not a small you know, amount. The second case I want to show you is a well board that uh, was drilled, uh, was supposed to be drilled actually based on uh, only pore pressure and frag gradient. And then uh, what we did, we added the, the red curve to it to show that, you know, the, the mud weight uh, window is, is narrower than what, what you think. But the problem here was that this section, the window is so narrow, right? That it's, it's impossible to drill, you know, even with this complex look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven casing and one liner. It was the is the most complex you know, casing design I've ever seen in my life. But even with this, they decided to, to stop drilling. They, they, it was a no drilling case. They didn't want, they decided not to drill. So from geomechanics point of view, we, we could solve this problem for them. And that was, that was quite simple for us because we created those polar plots in this interval and it gave us the, the safest you know, trajectory for drilling with minimum mud weight. Uh, and when we change the orientation of the well, basically all these lines change, except the pore pressure, which kind of is constant. The, the collapse gradient and the frag gradient both change, right? So let's see what happened. We changed the orientation of the well to this, right? So we, go, we went uh, 45 degree in that section, and then we went back to vertical without missing the target. And see what happens. Now we got the widest mud weight window in this section that was basically the problematic. And we managed to eliminate, I think, about five casing sets. And people who are in drilling, they know how expensive it is to actually uh, put a casing. And saving five you know, casing string is a huge amount of money. So geomechanics did two things. First of all, we made an impossible drilling case possible. And we, we saved a huge amount of money by changing the casing design, right? Uh, so this is another example actually of uh, six well that we were already uh, drilled in, in a uh, 
uh, field in Asia Pacific. And the operator was drilling actually from different orientation to, to approach the reservoir and, and produce as soon as possible. Uh, what, what we did, uh, out of the six wells, three of them were, were actually failed. They, they couldn't get the target or they had huge amount of you know, drilling problems. Uh, it cost them a lot. Three, the, three of them actually were successful, okay? So what we did, we add this polar plot and colors to, their, to what they did previously, just to explain to them what they did, why they, these three wells were basically failed and the other one were successful, the green ones, right? So the first well they drilled was a vertical well. They drilled with a mud weight of 8.8, .8, right? But the model showed that actually they, they needed the mud weight around 9, 9.5 to, to drill safely. And this is why they, they, they failed, right? So what they did next, they drilled a deviated well without having geomechanics. So because they failed here, they increased the mod to 10.2 PPG. And they drilled, they were happy because everything was okay. But the model actually showed them that they didn't need 10.2 PPG. They actually could drill with nine. And you know, th this, is, this is cost, right? So you, you did, I mean, the well was got to the target, you did it well, but you spent a lot more than what, what it needed, right? So the next well, they drilled was basically uh, another well, right? So I think I, 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 I got the, I went to the wrong order. So the, this is the second well they drilled. It was successful, but it was overbalanced. The next well, they kept the mud weight the same because this one was successful and it was 30 degree deviated and this is the same. So it should be exactly the same, but it was not, it failed, right? Why? Because the S-stress model, the rock property shows that they need more than 10.4 no, PPG. So they increased it to 10.2. It was too overbalanced. They went to horizontal with 11, with 10.5. They failed. They increased it to 11. Successful, but too overbalanced. So overall, we showed them how important it is to have geomechanics before you know planning for a well and do the drilling. So let me jump over this. This is actually the, the first horizontal well drill in, 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 in UK for shale gas. And we help this operator to basically optimize the drilling and uh, uh, do, do uh, an appraisal well, which is the S-shaped well, and then two horizontal wells for the first time in the UK. Uh, and they came us, uh, to us basically because of the two, three wells that they previously drilled and they were a collection of different type of no uh, problems. As you see here, if you uh, look at these problems and uh, try to correlate them with this color, you see they, they got huge amount of fluid losses. They got tight holes, the well bore stability problem, formation collapse problem. They had to, you know, uh, sidetrack the well. So this, they, they got to the point that they need to have a reliable geomechanical model, right? So this is the first well they drilled. The second well it was the same situation. The third well, the same situation. After five, six years, they started drilling again and they used geomechanical model and this was the result. Basically, there was absolutely no drilling problems. This point you see here, they're, they're the coring point, they're not problems. The only issues uh, were some losses in the reservoir through natural fractures that they didn't exist in any of the offset wells, other wells. So this is why we couldn't see them. But it was really good news because uh, we noticed that in the shale section that they were going to uh, uh, frag and produce is, is fractured, but it's good for production, right? So uh, we saved several days on drilling for them. Uh, plus actually this model helped them to, to do hydraulic fracturing later on in the field. So remember we talked about underbalanced drilling and I said that the only condition to do underbalance is to basically have the collapse pressure below the pore pressure. And I, I'm gonna show you a, a, a one case example that we did in, in, in Northern Iraq and uh, uh, the, the reservoir was a carbonate, which was quite fractured, uh, but at top, uh, on the top of it, we had a very weak, you know, shaley and silty section. And the company wanted to do underbalanced drilling for many reasons. The model that we provide to them showed that actually the collapse pressure, uh, pressure in, the, in the overburden is, is far above pore pressure. So if you do, go underbalance here, it's gonna be a disaster. But in the reservoir, it's fine. You can do it because the, it's, it's actually the red line. Uh, I put black here, that is the, coming out of the sulfur. Don't get confused. 
So here we can do underbalance, of course, right? So they didn't take our advice and they do underbalance from I mean, all the way uh, from overburden to the, to the reservoir. And if you are interested to see what the result was, here we go. These are the cavings that they could retrieve from downhole in the silty section. They never got to the reservoir, of course, right? But these, these are so big that they couldn't even uh, remove them with circulation. They had to fish them, right? They, they used fishing operation to, to recover them. And no, we don't want it to happen, right? And uh, I usually, when I talk about this, <laughs> this, this project, I, uh, it reminds me of this cartoon that you want to help people and they just don't have time to listen to you, right? We should avoid that. So let's move to the production applications. Uh, uh, probably I have another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I try to make it short. Uh, let's talk about fractured reservoirs, which is quite important for different applications. Uh, if we have a reservoir with several you know, fractures in different orientations uh, and ask a production engineer, I mean, what is the best trajectory to drill into these fractures to get the maximum production? Usually, I mean, the most common answer you hear is that perpendicular to the biggest set of fractures, right? This way we get maximum production. The smarter guys would tell you that, you know, in an orientation that we intersect with max, maximum number of the fractures, right? So if we create a polar plot with the fractures and we, we drill into the orientation with maximum cluster of the fractures, both answers are wrong. And the reason is that out of all these uh, bunch of fractures, uh, only a portion of them are productive or permeable. They have permeability, they can produce, right? The rest of the fractures are tightly closed, so you cannot get production out of them, okay? How we can differentiate between these two groups? So it's quite simple actually in geomechanics. All we need to do is to put these fractures with their geometry, orientation, and dip under a stress condition, geomechanical model, and calculate. So, you know, we have geomechanical model, it means we have vertical and horizontal stresses, then with simple math, we can calculate a normal stress on top of each single fracture and the shear stress parallel to it. And you know, among these two stress components, sigma n, normal stress is the resisting, basically supporting uh, component. It helps a uh, fracture stay stable, but the shear component wants to the fracture to shear, to fail, right? So the ratio between these two esters component tell us if the fracture will get ac activated because of our, our operation or not. Or is it close to the uh, you know, critical esters condition to be easily reactivated or might be activated already? Now, active faults, actually their ratio of tau to sigma n is, is quite high. So this is why they're active. Now, dead fractures are the ones that the ratio is, is the small, so they cannot, they need, they need to get uh, stimulated basically to, uh, to get fracked. So we want to differentiate or separate this, what we call it critically stressed fractures or optimally oriented to stress direction fractures from those fractures which are close. And to do that, we need a more circle analysis. Basically, more circles are coming from stress magnitudes so this is the minimum horizontal stress, maximum horizontal and vertical stress in a normal stress regime. Basically, largest stress, medium stress and uh, smallest stress, right? And then this line here comes from the property of the faults and fractures in the, in the area, right? We can guess that if we don't, we can measure the fractures, you know, cohesion and friction angle in the lab, or we can just guess the, the major uh, faults uh, friction angle, and then we can draw this line. And then these points are these fractures. If we have sigma n and tau on top of each fracture, then we can plot them on, on this because it's tau and sigma n here, right? So basically fractures which are above the, the failure line or failure criteria, they're, they're, they're the ones that are critically stressed. And then <clears throat> the next step is to plot them on top of a polar plot, and then color coded them to productive fractures, which are these white ones versus the black ones, which are these red ones here, right? Now, the biggest cluster of fractures are at this orientation. It means if we drill a, a vertical well, 
according to the classical way of thinking, we should get the maximum production. But the fact, fact is that if you do really vertical, well, you either don't get any production or it would be really minimum, okay? Uh, so what's the best orientation? We have a big cluster of you know, productive fractures here. So let's drill a, ver uh, a deviated well 60 degree toward west, and that will give us the maximum production, okay? You might ask this question that, I mean, we have this, these fractures all over, right? Well, why you see that you know, vertical well, we don't intersect with any of these fractures? The answer is yes, we do. We, we do interact with all the fractures, but let me explain it with a, a very simple uh, cartoon here. So imagine all these blue fractures are productive, the red ones are not productive. And then we drill a vertical well here. So we intersect with one, two, three, four productive fractures, critical stress fractures, right? The rest of fractures are closed, no production. Now, what happens if I drill this well? It's very uh, impossible case, but in this case, all the fractures that you're intersecting with, they are closed, so no production. How about this one, right? Now you're intersecting with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven productive fractures. So this is how the production gets you now maximized. Okay, I hope it's clear. Uh, I'm going to actually jump over this, uh, this case. This is the actual case that we did in, in, uh, in Venezuela. And by optimizing the orient orientation of the well world, we, we could actually maximize. We go from zero production to, to like 10 times production from here to here, right? So it, if production was this number five here, we did number 50 here, okay? Let's talk about hydraulic fracturing a little bit. This is the next application and uh, wh why we do hydraulic fracturing. The, the, I mean, the main application of it is to stimulate the reservoir and, and enhance the, the productivity, right? Or injectivity of the reservoir. Uh, some, I mean, in geothermal, we do it basically to introduce thermal energy to create, you know, uh, uh, heat flow within a reservoir and, and basically produce uh, geothermal energy. In CO2 sequestration or carbon storage, uh, we do it to, to inject CO2 into the reservoir and store it, right? Uh, some people do mini frag, which are a small scale, you know, hydraulic fracturing to, to, to measure the stress, the minimum horizontal stress. And then uh, some companies are actually do hydraulic fracturing to re-inject uh, drilling cuttings, right? Into, into the subsurface and getting rid, in, rid of them. Uh, so hydraulic fracturing has uh, many uh, aspects, like operational aspect, fluid aspect, how to design the fluid, uh, what should be the concentration of the propellant, and all of these things. But uh, the geomechanics uh, benefits to hydraulic fracturing, first of all, uh, we can increase the efficiency with identifying frackable intervals, right? Specifically talking about shale or ductile formations, we need to identify frag, uh, intervals that we can frag, we can initiate or create a fracture because if the rock is ductile, is plastic, there's no way we can initiate a fracture and we, we lose the whole operation, right? So we can control the growth of hydraulic fracture. We can, we can basically uh, design the, the, the pumping uh, schedule and also the uh, downhole pressure to keep the size of the fracture within the, the reservoir so we don't frack into the cap rock or we don't frack into the water below the, the reservoir. It's very important. We can predict the orientation of fractures by knowing the orientation of stress and stress magnitude. We can kind of predict the, which orientation the fracture would go and how it can interact with the natural fractures. And of course, we can optimize drilling direction to minimize, to minimize hydraulic fracturing uh, pressure, how much pressure you need down there. The lower the pressure you need to frack, it means uh, your pumps would be cheaper. And geomechanics can help you optimize to change the orientation to basically uh, go for minimum downhole pressure. Let's do a quick uh, overview here. So imagine we are in normal stress regime. So we know that the minimum horizontal, uh, minimum stress is, is the minimum horizontal stress, right? And we know that if you want to open a fracture for this induced fracture, it's, it's easier to open perpendicular to the minimum stress, right? It's physically, mechanically, it's, it's, it needs less energy. So it means that if we hydraulic fracture a formation under normal stress regime, the frac 
would be perpendicular to the minimum horizontal stress, right? But since the vertical stress is larger than the maximum horizontal stress, the extension of the fracture would be high, uh, larger than the height of the fracture because there's more restraint, basically constraint on the, on the fracture vertically. If we move to the strike sleep stress regime, now the minimum stress is S still SH mean, right? So the fracture would be vertical, but now because SH max is larger than SV, the height of the fracture, height grow would be larger than the lateral you know, extension. So the, the fracture goes from basically this shape in normal stress regime to this shape, okay? And now moving to a, a reverse stress regime, so now the minimum stress, minimum principal stress is actually the vertical stress, right? So the fracture would be horizontal, perpendicular to the vertical stress. So it's very important that we know the stress regime because if we go and try to frag a reverse stress regime to create a shale gas development project is a big failure because the horizontal fracture are not going to contribute in production from shale gas that much, right? We need to create multiple, you know, uh, vertical fractures to be able to create a, a good, you know, gas or oil flow. <clears throat> now, these are the ideal cases when we don't have natural fractures. If we have natural fractures and we create induced fractures, the first uh, natural fracture, the, the, frac the hydraulic fracture meet, mm -hmm. it might actually pass through it, it might reactive, reactivate that fracture and pass through it, or it might get arrested with that. So we might get actually diverted from the, the natural orientation that it would like I think there's something wrong with the voice. Oh, really? Yeah, now, now it is back. Now it okay. is back. So okay, can you sorry. repeat the last statement, please repeat. Yes, so in these cases, when we, are, we have a naturally fractured formation, instead of creating a planar and single induced fracture, we create a zone of, a stimulated zone of you know, fractures, uh, which uh, basically uh, is extended perpendicular to the minimum principal stress again, right? And this is what we really like. When we talk about tight formation, we want to actually create a, uh, a zone where the, the induced fracture is involved with several natural fractures. This is how we get maximum production from the, from the well. And we have actually capabilities, software capabilities. If we have good geomechanical model, we can, we can kind of model this type of you know, uh, interaction between natural fractures and induced fracture. So uh, with respect to modeling of uh, hydraulic fracturing in 3D, uh, again, uh, software capability is quite important. Uh, we need to be able to basically develop a 3D geometry for the fractures. So this geometry should uh, show us the evolution of the fracture by pumping, because we pump fluid and we pump uh, propent to keep the fracture open. Uh, and it gets, you know, uh, interact interaction with the natural fractures. So the software should be able to do that. Uh, usually, uh, we have to actually do numerical modeling. Uh, there are a lot of softwares in the, the market which use analytical methods, very simple. Those are not really successful in giving us the, <clears throat> the geometry of the expected geometry of the fractures. We are still far away from the uh, reality, I would say here, uh, because there are a lot of uncertainties in our models, in, in, in capability of comp our computational capabilities. But, you know, uh, we are getting close. We try to improve our model by adding complexity to, in, uh, to it, adding, you know, anisotropy, uh, heterogeneity to our models to get closer to reality. But uh, geomechanics help us to, to move toward that direction, right? Uh, like one thing that we can do with, with, with uh, basically a geomechanics is to consider for the near wellbore tortuosity, right? Because if the wellbore is, is deviated to the stress, you know, uh, principal stress orientation near the wellbore actually uh, the fracture geometry follows the hoop stress but when we go further from the uh, the well we, we go to the orientation that basically virgin stress condition dictates right and then when we do uh, multiple hydraulic fracturing 
there is something called stress shadowing. Each fracturing stage changes the, the estrus condition for the next stage of fracturing. So it changes the geometry of the uh, fracture because now stresses are different, right? So geomechanical, 3D geomechanical models or software which are based on 3D uh, geomechanics, they can basically predict uh, this type of shadowing effect. Uh, so uh, this is an example of a tight carbonate in, in Pakistan that we try to basically uh, uh, provide frac design and frac modeling for them. And this uh, case was actually messed by a, a major service company before. Uh, and uh, we did try to actually find the reason why, why they couldn't uh, frac this formation and uh, what should we do to, to basically improve the operations. So what they did in this uh, basically uh, uh, tight carbonate, they drill a well, right? They did acidizing, matter acidizing to basically clean the, uh, remove the damage. So they get about uh, initially after acidizing 11, you know, uh, MMSCFD. So I, I'm not going to repeat that. So uh, initially they get this much productive uh, production, which declined very quickly to 1.7. Then a uh, service company uh, developed, I mean, uh, conducted a, a new technology fracking, uh, which basically is, is kind of pulsed fracturing that reduced the amount of propane in the, in the fracture, uh, which create these conduits for, for fluid to, to flow better actually to, toward the well. Uh, so after this operation, there was absolutely no production and then the company did another uh, acid fracturing. So they acidized they created fracture and they got 1.5, kind of the same as before uh, fracking again. So it was a failure and uh, the objective of our work was first of all to identify why this technology didn't work there. Uh, so we found actually we are in a high uh, stress regime. So the, the closure pressure on the fracture is, is very high. So the idea of injecting less propound was not really a good idea. And then, you know, uh, why do we need highways when, when, when we are talking about a tight formation? It's like, you know, building a highway in the middle of a village, uh, which people actually don't have cars, right? Or a few cars. So uh, it, it, the idea was not really best uh, match for this, this stress and uh, flow condition. And then uh, we were supposed to provide them with the, with the model. So we did 3D geomechanical modeling, stress modeling, you know, rock property estimation. We include the faults, the major faults and fractures in the model. We got the stress orientation. Uh, and then this is the geometry of the weld. The plan was to drill a semi-horizontal weld. This is the vertical weld that was unsuccessfully fractured before. And then uh, we had the cap rock of shale, which we were not supposed to frack into it. And the, the worst news was that we had water level, actually, a water spill point below the, the well, which at the toe of the well, we were as close of 20 meters to the water. So it was fracturing would be very risky, actually. We don't want to frack into the water. Uh, otherwise, we have to shut down that, that interval. So our design is based on like 10 intervals. The intervals were not uh, basically lengthwise the same. We decided lengths based on the actual fractures in the uh, there, there were some fracture corridors in some sections, uh, but not in other sections. So based on this geometry, these restrictions, limitations, we had to actually design a, a adoptive and flexible uh, design for each stage to be able to basically get the production. And remember, it's an open hole. They didn't case and perforate it. So it's open hole is really difficult to to frack open holes uh, in compare with the you now perforated walls. So we did some initial design based on the typical, you know, uh, frack design softwares. Uh, we did both uh, acid uh, fracturing modeling and we did uh, a propant fracking as well. Just to, you, to show, show you some of the results of our 3D hydraulic fracturing modeling, like these are the kind of videos that we can create. Uh, using software uh, and it shows us as we inject you no know, fluid and propound you know uh, continuously how the fracture basically grow after each pumping is scheduled right and you would know actually how far your fractures goes from your well and how, what's the orientation and geometry of the fracture okay just to you show you i mean what type of outputs we can create out of geomechanical modeling 
And then the final uh, design was that, okay, for zone one, because we are very close to the water level, uh, we need to create very uh, small fractures. We didn't even take the risk of fracturing. We went for matrix acidizing, but zone four to two, uh, we use a concept called uh, close fracture acidizing. We are still uh, rather close to the, to the water. So we want to create medium sized fractures. Okay, so what we did, uh, you know, typically acid fracking creates rather a small fractures. We want to make it a little bit bigger. So we create fractures with fluid only, no propant, and we let the fracture to close and then we acidize the fracture. So we get a medium sized fracture, which is etched by acid, right? And it works very well in, in carbonate. And then zone four to eight, because we, we could create large fractures. So we went for a you know, uh, typical, you know, um, type of gel uh, propant fracturing. Uh, it's clear flag, uh, frag basically the fluid that we use. And then the, the nine and 10 stages, because they were very close to the cap rock and we didn't want to break into the cap rock, we use like, a, like a, a smaller size type of design. And uh, you see, uh, we are not copy and pasting uh, design from one stage to another stage because it is the typical way that, uh, especially in the shale gas development in the US people do. Each stage has its, its own rock property, a stress condition, and we have to be very adopted to that, that and, and be flexible with, with our design. So fracturing was quite successful and uh, I think the, the well is kind of producing right now. Uh, Ahmed, uh, should I cut it here? Uh, because I think we are, far over the... I, I believe it is very uh, informative. Just go ahead. Oh, really? Yeah. They don't get uh, sick of me, you think? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. <laughs> the comments, uh, the comments are, uh, everyone is enjoying the lecture. Oh, I hope so. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's look at the reservoir compaction now. Now, uh, you know, we have a reservoir which is impact. Uh, we create, we, we drill some wells and we start uh, producing, right? We might inject into the well to basically replace the, the amount of oil and gas that, that we are uh, uh, removing. Uh, but typically at the beginning of the fill, because the pressure is high enough, we, we don't we just uh, let the, the, the reservoir to produce. So the pressure, reservoir pressure is start, start declining, right? It goes down and down because we are, we are producing from it. So what happens when the reservoir pressure dec uh, declines? So Remember, we have three stresses, principal stresses acting on a reservoir. And then this pore pressure is kind of contributing to hold these this stresses back from the matrix of the rock, right? So when we reduce the pore pressure in the, in the, in the you know, uh, pore space of the reservoir, so the, the portion of the total stress which applies to the matrix of the rock increases. So we call it effective stress. Effective stress is basically total stress minus pore pressure, right? Total stress is what we calculated with geomechanics. Mm -hmm. Pore pressure, we predicted. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so the higher the effective stress, the rock deformation will be more because there are more stress acting on the rock. So rock gets compacted, the pore space gets smaller, the pore throat, which basically creates permeability, will start getting closer. And at the end of the day, the production decreases, mm -hmm. right? We get more flow, uh, less flow, less production. So this is typical, but we need to be able to predict it, to plan for it, right? Do we want to predict? Because the, the quicker that, that, that we produce, uh, we have to shut down the, the reservoir earlier and we, we leave more oil and gas inside the reservoir. The longer term that we manage the reservoir, we can produce more. It's longer term, longer time. We don't get money as soon as you know, we want. But we produce in a set of now 20% of the reservoir, oil and gas, we can produce maybe 30%, right? So it, it adds a lot of you know, value to the, to the total, uh, basically, uh, benefit that we get from the reservoir. So geomechanics help us to uh, basically correlate uh, stresses with permeability, porosity, and ultimately production. So this type of study, we have to start from the lab by performing some uh, tests called compaction tests. 
So we basically take core plugs from the rock, we take it to the lab, we put the core plug under a stress and pressure condition that we have in the reservoir. And then we start draining the sample like production. So we let the pore pressure to decline slowly, slowly in the steps. And it gives us the parameters that we need to back calculate the, the changes in porosity and permeability. We get, uh, we get the depletion factor, we get, uh, I don't know, uh, compaction uh, coefficient of the rock, we get compressibility of the solid, compressibility of the fluid, and compressib uh, compressibility of the bulk of the rock. And all of them together give us a, actually change in the porosity and permeability due to a stress or production, right? So when reservoir engineers look at these plots, they know that if they follow this production profile in 10 years from now, what would be the production of the field? In 50 years from now, in one year from now, right? We don't claim that you're 100% accurate, but even if you are 60%, 7% accurate, then it helps us to manage the, the production and, and, and increase the final production. Another, uh, basically so, with uh, 3D reservoir geomechanics modeling, we can predict uh, what is happening to the horizontal stress after five years, 10 years, and so on. So this is the, the North Sea Reservoir that we, we provide modeling for it back in 2015. And you see that our model actually show, show how horizontal stress has changed in 2016, 18, 30, 30 right? Considering a, a given, you know, production. Uh, profile. If you change the production profile, then you will see different color codes here. This is changes in the vertical stress. What else we can do? We can we can look at the. Uh, let me see what uh, is covered here. This is the pore pressure changes actually over time, and then it show we can actually see what faults and fracture gets reactivated, where there are stress concentration around the faults fractures, and how they get basically. Uh, reactivated by compaction of the of the reservoir, right? So these color codes are shows how much reservoir is compacted, and these, you know, uh, hot colors you see here, they're around faults and fractures which are getting uh, reactivated. And why they get reactivated? If you remember those critical stress fractures, we are artificially increasing the the, the shear component in compared with the vertical component, right? By 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 production by changing the the pore pressure and stresses. Okay, so we need to be able to, to predict which which faults are dangerous to be reactivated, which one are basically are going to be hazardous for for our production, or in general, which one are, are going to create a micro seismic, right? We don't want to to see micro seismic. So opposite to to production is injection. When you start injecting for either EOR or any reason like water flooding or CO2 injection. You are doing opposite. Now you are increasing the, the pore pressure in the reservoir. You are changing the stresses again, and you might actually reactivate another set of fractures and, and faults. So geomechanics help us to, to basically predict that. Oh, that was the last slide. Okay, good. So we as I mean we covered some drilling applications and some reservoir applications. There are more applications that uh, uh, I mean if, if you are interested, you can read books. On geomechanics, there are a bunch of papers out there. I'm more than happy to actually share with you a, a package of, I mean, several uh, materials that you can read if you're interested to learn more. Uh, and you have my email here if you want to ask your questions in case your question was not addressed. Uh, Nihal, I'm, I'm ready to take any questions if we have time. Yeah, I leave we, it yeah we actually have lots of questions. I've picked a few that were repeated so um the first question uh, uh why is fracking harder in open hole wells oh sorry what was the question i didn't catch it why is hydraulic fraction harder in the open hole wells oh okay because you know uh let, let me correct myself uh it it is more complex because when you are concentrated, you no, know, in an case and perforated hole, you are injecting through perforation. So you know exactly which point of the rock you are injecting to. But imagine if you have 200 meters of open interval and you are injecting into the whole interval, so you don't really know where the fracture would go, where, where you initiate a fracture, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and usually because of the larger scale, you need higher uh, downhole pressure 
because you have to pressurize a 200 you know meter by area of the well uh, you you need more liquid you need more pressure to actually create a fracture so this why is more challenging and less space you have less control on on the on the geometry of the of the fracture yeah. good question okay so uh, there's another question that I, I i don't really understand uh, <laughs> someone is saying what is the influence of the hydraulic fracturing on the natural fracture as i said <clears throat> when we create a fracture an induced fracture hydraulic fracture and it intersect with the natural fracture right <clears throat> depends how critically stress this fracture is this fracture might reopen this fracture activate it right and pass through it or might get actually arrested by it right so there are several scenarios right so what 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 we really prefer to do is to reactivate all the natural fractures that get intersected with the with the fracture and then pass through and continue the induced fracture as well, right? Uh, but yeah, if, if the fracture is really, really dead fracture, it might, it might just stop the hydraulic fracturing and then no propagation anymore, right? So, so we, we, we can do this type of modeling uh, both in the lab and with new medical modeling to, to predict what happens in the, the reservoir. Okay, um, uh, the same question, what is the best way to be the eye? We already answered that um, in, the, uh, in the lab. Uh, can you like talk more about uh, the cl fracture closure when yes. it comes to the intersection as well? Yeah, very good question. So imagine we, we, we open a fracture, right? So there's a normal stress component on top of this fracture that tries to close it, right? And that, that stress is, 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 is fracture closure stress, which is kind of equivalent to the, to the uh, minimum principal stress. In, in, in a, let's say if, if the stresses are not tilted, it is, it's kind of equivalent to the, uh, let's say, minimum horizontal stress, right? So when we perform a mini frac test or in the shale gas industry diffit uh, test, what we do, we create a, a small, you know, uh, fracture, small enough to go over the hoop stress to the version stress, and then we let the fracture, let the pressure decline, and basically uh, we we uh, create a decline curve. It, it, it is a time versus pressure downhole, which shows how the pressure is declining, how the fluid is getting out of the fluid, out of the well, or leaking to the formation. And with that plot and it doing, I mean, running a G function analysis, we can basically get estimation of the uh, for, uh, closure pressure, which is equivalent to the minimum principal stress. Okay, so um, another question, another actually good question. How, how does the mud weight maintain the pressure at different sections of the well? Yeah, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question as well. Imagine if you have an interval of one kilometer, right? And uh, you, you go down and you increase your mud weight, mud pressure. So you are, you are supporting the rock with that pressure. Typically, when we go deeper and deeper, we have to increase the, uh, the, the fluid pressure, right? Because both the pore pressure and collapse gradient are increasing. So you need to increase the, the mud weight. But the highest mud weight that you are applying to the well is applied to the whole one kilometer, the whole interval. So you have to be... You have to make sure that this mud weight you are using in 1,000 meter to keep the rock is not fracking your formation now in, in, in 100 meter, right? Down. And this is how we do casing design. We design the casing somehow that the minimum mud weight and the maximum mud weight in the interval is not creating fracking or losses, uh, losses or collapse, right? And th th this is exactly th 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 one of the main, uh, basically, or input to the casing designing. So we make sure that the maximum pressure in, the, in an interval can be taken, can be undertaken basically by the, uh, by the um, shallower intervals. Yeah. I don't know if I answered the question or... Yes, we still have questions. Um, just a second.
Okay. Uh, what are the considerations related to rock mechanics that we have to take into consideration while drilling HP HT wells? Okay, good question. Yeah, okay. Apart from all the typical rock properties that we include into the model for, I mean, uh, let's say normal temperature, we have to actually do some testing in the lab to measure the thermal uh, properties of the, of the rock. And that includes the thermal, uh, you know, the expansion, expansion coefficient, the thermal, uh, basically uh, pro, uh, the, the, the effect of thermal shock on the rock, the, the effect of thermal uh, or temperature on the rock elastic properties and also S strength of the rock. These are the tests that we can basically we, do, uh, we can do with what we call it elevated temperature testing. If we do it, you know, if we have, we have a triaxial uh, cell and it is um, equipped for elevated temperature, we can, we can test the Young's modulus Poisson ratio under different thermal condition. We can basically, uh, we can do hydraulic fracturing under, under, under temperature. Right, and one parameter that stress wise we need is the thermal shock or thermal stress that needs to be added to the calculation of the stress changes around the well bore. And it influences both frac gradient to a larger extent and to a, low, uh, a smaller extent uh, the, the collapse gradient, right? But it's a, it's a good question, it's a kind of advanced geomechanical modeling that, that we do if the uh, the well is HPHT. Okay, last question. Or geothermal. Uh, uh, last question. And in, in directional drilling, what route we should go? Um, we drill through minimum stress and enhance ROP or maximum stress for well bull stability? So, my like one sentence answer to this question is that don't do any of them. Don't try to decide about the trajectory of the well using your brain, because there are a lot of parameters going to that. Basically decision, let's go back to this one. You see these colors? It, it, do, it does answer your question. It, these colors depends on the stress regime, rock properties, pore pressure, and they all together create basically recommendation for drilling trajectory. So it's really, really naive and risky to, to just say, okay, it's better to go to, toward you know, minimum horizontal stress. It's better to go toward maximum horizontal stress. In this case, our best case is, is, is actually disorientation. It is not any of those orientation. It's not any of the, the principal stresses, right? So there are a combination of different parameters that, that basically dictate which, which orientation is the best and never try to do it just, just, I mean, just do a geomechanical modeling to, to tell you what to do. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much for the amazing lecture. Everyone in the comment section and chat and everything is asking for you to come back and give another lecture. So we'd like to have you back. Sorry, what was Again. the question? It's not a question. I'm just saying thank you and that everyone is saying that they want you back. Oh, thank you very much. It was, it was a yeah. pleasure actually to give this presentation. I'm sorry if it got longer than expected. So I hope uh, people Hamid, take something uh, home with them. Mm -hmm. Hamid, do, do you promise you will be back with us? Yeah, why not? Just I want to register that. I want to record that. So uh, yeah. that's a promise. Yeah, maybe we can uh, concentrate on, on one application and, and uh, go more detail into one of them. Okay. Uh, just get okay. feedback from audiences which application they, they like more and then maybe we can, we can yeah. talk more about that one. We, we can do that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But uh, it was a pleasure. I mean, uh, very good, uh, uh, good questions and uh, uh, it means that your audiences are really smart. Yes, they are. Yeah, they are. And, uh, and the structure also is very smart. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for everyone on the call, have a good weekend, sleep well, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.